morning, everybody. So everybody's been sitting here staring at this image. Does anybody know what it is? Does anybody see the critter in there? Okay. Yeah. So so that's a copperhead right there. Um, I kind of took that picture down on Fort Riley. Um, so you can see how good they are at hiding in the leaves. And we'll talk a little bit more about them in a bit. So um, reptiles and amphibians. I'm going to start you off with a little phylogenetic tree so you can see where reptiles and amphibians fit in the overall construction of all the animals, or at least the birds, the um, So this amphibian, this is an ancient group of um, tetrapods. Anybody want to take a guess at what group descended from them? Amphibians. Amphibians, right. So these are in the amphibians, the amphibian lineage. Um, and then we have this group called synapsids, which you probably are not familiar with. Anybody want to take a while to guess what descended from that? Mammals. Mammals, yep. So the synapsids, the descendants of the synapsids are the mammals. Testudines, got to be able to get this one. Turtles. Turtles, right. So that's the turtles. So the first of the modern, rep, what we think of as reptiles, um, was the turtles. Lepidi, Lepidosauromorpha. Lizards. Lizards, yes, but also snakes. So this is the squamates, which includes the lizards, the snakes, and the amphibians. Which, and I'll give you the list of these here in a minute. Um, how about plesiosaurs and ichthyosaurs? This is this is actually a trick question. These are extinct. They went extinct. No, no descendants from them. What about Kuratarsi? Yep. So that's the crocodilians, the alligators, um, and the crocodiles. Pterosaurs? Pterosaurs. Nope, not birds. That one actually went extinct too. Or Nithia, how do you say that? They're called bird hip dinosaurs because of the shape of their hips, but they're actually not ancestors of birds. So that one went extinct too. Sauropods? <laughs> just, just doing this, yeah, they went extinct. Theropods. Who's left? These. Birds. Birds. Right, so these are the animals like raptors, the two two legged meat eating dinosaurs, um, allosaurs, tyrannosaurus rex, all of those are in that group. Um, and their surviving descendants are the birds. So if you look at this thing, and it's really interesting, a lot of the things that we've always thought of as bird characteristics that evolved just in birds, at least when I was young, and probably at least some of you, um, that feathers evolved for flight that hollow bones evolved for flight, that the unique breathing apparatus of birds evolved for flight, it didn't. Theropods had feathers. Sauropods had the air sacs that, that are part of the lungs and the breathing apparatus of birds, and they had, um, the theropods had the sort of the hollow bone structure. So all the things that we always used to say evolved for flight actually evolved before flight. And so they sort of set the birds up to be able to fly, to evolve. Um, what, so, where were the T Rexes in there? The, T Rexes the are theropods. Yep. And, and fish actually are farther down here. So these are the tetrapods, the four legged group of four legged. So if you look at this, yeah. oh, sorry to interrupt you. Um, That's fine. So, you know, typically, like alligators are talked about as a really ancient reptile. Mm -hmm. um, but if I'm looking at this, I'm guessing amphibians and turtles are even more ancient. Yep. <laughs> okay. Yeah, the, the thing they say about crocodilians and, and alligators is that they're living fossils. They've not changed much since they first evolved. And that's kind of a, a, a misnomer because they have changed. Evolution occurs constantly. They just look a lot like they used to look, right? So their morphology is very similar to what it used to be. Uh, and there's a couple of other things. There's a group of animals in here that has not changed much either that are also called living fossils but and turtles too so so things like that they're called living fossils but they have changed over time it's just not as obvious 
Um, and if you look at this, <coughs> amphibians are here. Then you've got mammals, then you've got turtles, snakes and lizards, crocodiles, and then birds are up there. And so amphibians and reptiles are kind of all over the place, right? And people who are herpetologists, they, they're like, you got to know everything. So it's kind of complicated. So if we look at the diversity of these things, um, insects, of course, way out compete everybody. Most of the living animals on the planet are insects. Um, so lots and lots of insects, but, you know, a fair number of mammal species, bird species, fish, there's gobs and gobs of fish. Um, if you look at amphibians and reptiles together, they're about the same, they're probably a little more than birds and mammals together. And if you add birds to the reptiles, where they probably should be, um, you increase that even more. If we break it down to the amphibians, there's three big groups of amphibians. Um, you're probably familiar with salamanders and frogs and toads. And then the Sicilians, anybody ever hear heard of Sicilians? Sicilians are amphibians, but they're legless amphibians. And they tend to be more tropical, um, they burrow. So these, this number of 205, there's probably way more of them out there that nobody's found because you've got to dig up the jungle floor to find them, right? So like our, our legless lizard we have out here. Yes, except it's an amphibian. But it is an amphibian. Yep. So Sicilians are legless amphibians. Um, and then we have the turtles and crocodiles and pahara, which is one species in New Zealand that's very different. They look like lizards, but they're not really lizards. Um, and these are the, the sort of ancient lineages that, that we were talking about. And big differences between these if you look at their skulls, turtles are what we call anapsid. They don't have any openings in the skull behind the eye sign. So an means no, and apsid apparently means opening in the skull. Uh, so they're anapsid. And crocodilians and tataras are what we call diapsid. They have two openings behind the skull. Anybody know where mammals fit? Yeah, so so they only have one opening, so the diapsids were turned into one opening. So so anapsid, no opening behind the skull, behind the eye socket. Diapsid, two openings, synapsid, one. So I have one hole in my head somewhere. Yeah, back here. So. And then if you get into just the squamates, which are um, the lizards and snakes, and a group called amphizianids. Um, these have a modified diapsid skull. So it's not just two holes, it's like all these weird openings and stuff. Um, and amphibians are sort of like the Sicilians. They're a legless reptile that is not a snake. And again, they're mostly tropical, so we don't have any around here. And they're probably a lot more than we have there. They're, they're burrowing. Birds also have that modified diapsid skull but it's modified in a different way. So if we just focus in on Kansas, and you're probably all familiar with, have you, have you done climate in Kansas? So you're probably all familiar with this already. But we've got this massive rainfall gradient across the state and very tight rainfall gradient. Um, and then there's a little bit of a temperature gradient from south to north. And if you look at the animals, the reptiles and amphibians that we have here, so there's 30 species of amphibians, 68 species of reptiles until you know people start splitting out the species some more, which they've been doing really. Um, statewide, there's eight amphibian species and 25 reptile species. So that cover most of the state. Then if you break it down into sort of climatic regions, we, we can add another amphibian to the west um, and six reptiles to the west. You get into the moister east areas and you increase those numbers, especially the, the reptiles, since we have more of them. There's 19. And that's mostly turtles because the turtles tend to be in the more wetter regions. Again, going down south to the more wetter regions again, you increase even more. And Cherokee County ups it further, right? especially for the amphibians. Three actually. These three 
extra reptiles here are invasive. They're introduced species. Somebody had them as a pet and they escaped. And they're right now, they're limited to the urban heat shields around Lawrence, Topeka, Kansas City. Um, actually, I think there's a couple in the haze now. But those are like the Mediterranean gecko um, and a couple of uh, uh, the Italian wall lizard, and then there's another one that's Canada. So if climate change continues and we start warming up more, those are going to escape from those urban heat shields and start moving out into the countryside. What's in the far southeast there? The water markets in the Down here, yeah. <laughs> And then we also have some, some dry and warm specialists that are out in the West and the Southwest. Could you go back to that and just confirm water moccasins are only in that state? Yep. And we'll get to that later on. So <laughs> they're only in Cherokee County. I might disagree with that too. No, they're only in Cherokee County. Um, I mean, they might, you know, like get into one or two of those counties around Cherokee. For the most part, very true. So, uh, what was I gonna oh, Kansas is sort of in the middle of the state, in the middle of the country, right? And, and we're kind of on the border of all these different kinds of eco regions. So, we've got forest type organisms coming in here, we've got desert type organisms coming in here, we've got drier organisms coming from up below. So, we have these very interesting distributions of, of especially reptiles and amphibians, and probably some other animals too, because of that border part. And a lot of our endangered or in, in need of conservation species are around the edges because they just barely get into the state. So a little bit of research um, that we've done here since, since we are in Kansas and we do a lot of birding. Um, one of the things that we looked at here way back when, when I had a grad student, was how fire affects the, the distribution of, of reptiles and amphibians. And so here on Kansas, as you probably are already well aware, we've got annually burned watersheds four years and, and a 20 year mostly unburned watershed. And so we set up transects of traps and cover boards, which are just pieces of plywood that you can pick up and look under to see what is under there. Um, and spent a couple of years surveying for amphibians and reptiles. Um, and we only found 20 of the 34 species that are on Kanza because there's some of them like the collared lizards that are only on rock crevices that our transects didn't cover. So there's some that we didn't catch just because we didn't have the rock category. But we get more species in the annual burn. Um, and this, this increase here in the unburned is because our transects went into the woods and into the grass. So we ended up with more species here. We also found that some species prefer different burn treatments. So for annual burns, the line snake, and I'll, I'll show you some pictures of some of these later on. So the line snakes prefer annual burn. Um, the Great Plains skeet and the horned lizard prefer annual burns. And the narrow mouth toad prefers. Um, in the four-year burns, the common king snake and the racer like that part. The ground skink, um, the first four-year burns. And then only a couple of species preferred the uh, unburned, which were the ring and those. But they were more numerous. They were more numerous in those, so we, we say they preferred them. And so one of the things, and, and somebody else may have talked about this before, but one of the things about the prairie is that it's a mosaic of burned versus unburned versus partially burned area, right? And we get the highest diversity because things move around between all those things. So if something lights burned areas, it moves from burn to burn to burn, right? If we only had burned areas, we would lose a lot of diversity. If we only had unburned areas, we would lose a lot of diversity. So we need a mixture of both. This is what I call the, the snake or lizard eye view of a burned prairie. And this is the unburned prairie. So which one of those would you prefer to eat? It depends on the species, right? This is moisture habitat. It's got more shade, it's cooler if you live down close to the ground. So if you're an amphibian or, or something that likes moist and cool, this is what you would prefer. 
if you like high temperatures like the horn lizards, you would prefer the other. And there's differences in cover. So one of the biggest predators of snakes and lizards around here are the raptors, the hawks. Um, and so we actually took a bunch of rubber snakes and painted them to look like racers, which is the most common snake here. And we took them out and we put them in burn prairie, like that one. So that's a rubber snake, it's not real. And unburn. Can you even see the snake in there, right? And watched over a year to see how many raptor attacks there would be. And we measured that by whether they had actually bitten the snake or not. Some of them actually bit it in half. Um, and which one do you think the raptors found more snakes? Okay. Yep, the unburned. So, you know, it's not huge numbers, but because these snakes aren't moving and, and predators didn't zero in on that, but uh, definitely had more attacks in the burned areas. So if you're not fast enough or you don't have shelter to get away from a, a avian predator or something like that, then unburned is not or burned is not the place you want to be. Okay, so um, I'm going to be talking about the different families of reptiles and amphibians we have, and I'm going to have some examples of each one. And then I'm going to toss in some research between those. So anytime you have a question or anything, let me know. Um, and these maps that I put up, the colored counties are where those particular species are found. So for toads, we have two families of toads. We have seven species. And the two families are this one, which I can't really pronounce very well. I stumble when I pronounce it, but it's the spadefoot toads. And this one, which is the true toads, we call it. And the true toads are actually more closely related to frogs than they are to spadefoot toads. So spadefoot toads are the more ancestral group of uh, ignorance, which are the frogs and toads. Um, and the big difference is between them, the true toads have those parietal glands right behind the eye, which is where they keep their toxin. The spadefoot toads are not toxic, they don't have that. Um, and the spadefoot toads also have slit people eyes, as you can see in that. Um, they have eyes like, like cats slit people eyes. Um, we have one spadefoot toad here on Kanza. Um, but most of the, the spade foot toads are in um, western Kansas. And they, they go for um, intermittent pools that aren't around for very long. They fill up with water, they breathe in them, and then they're done. Yeah. I just wanted to point out that you've got the map of Kansas. I do, yes. Anything that's on Kansas will have the little map of Kansas. And I'm not showing all the species, but, but any, any of the things you see there. What's a spade foot? It's a type of toad. I'm not sure what else to tell you. <laughs> yeah, they have a funny shape to their back. But they used to help dig their Yeah, they're really cute. Yeah. Have you seen one out here? I've never seen one. We've got a monk on but I've never seen one. So, but the most common by far is the wood houses toad, which is pretty much over the whole state. And then the great thing is pretty common too. For frogs, we have several families of frogs. Um, tree frogs are my favorites. And this is one of the tree frogs that's most common. And if we go outside here a little bit, you'll probably hear them. Are they calling them? They have to. Yeah. yeah. So, so this is the most one of the most common ones out here and the ones that you'll hear. Um, see if I can get the sound to work and I'll play it for you. So, so anyway, these, this is the first species that comes out and, and starts calling around here in the spring. Um, spring peepers, which are tree frogs, are in the far east part of Kansas. Um, they're only in a few counties on the far eastern border. And they'll come out really early, too. But in this, this part of the state, these are the, the earliest ones that are out, the forest frogs. Um, they breed in, again, those intermittent pools, kind of like state fit toads, so they'll breed in wallows, mice and wallows, um, ditches, things like that. You don't ever find them around ponds, but they'll go for the little shallow bits of water. Um, and they'll attach their eggs to little bits of weed in the, in the pool. 
And because they're in wallows, we're really interested in them. We started studying, doing actual studies of wallows now. Um, and so we're kind of interested in coarse frogs and what they, they're doing in wallows and how they make decisions about it. Because they've got two different places that they can breed. They can breed in the wallows on these otherwise fairly dry uplands. And these frogs are only about two inches. So how the heck do they find those wallows way up on top of Kanzu? And how do they survive getting there? You know, but they do. And they, they'll breed in those wallows when there's enough water. And they can also breed in, in little pools in an intermittent streams. And so the wallows, they're safe from predators, but they risk getting dried out when those dry up. In the streams, predators can come up the stream, but they're less likely to get dried out and end up desiccated. Right? So, so how do you make decisions about that? Um, and we had a grad student way back when that looked at these, and she, she measured what happens to the water chemistry in the wallows and the streams over time. She popped tadpoles from both sites and put them into the lab, and then sort of mixed them up. So she put some wallow tadpoles in wallow water and in stream water, and vice versa. And so over time, the wallows become more basic the longer the water is in there. And you end up getting more ammonium in the, in the streams over time. So she, she did that experiment and mixed them up. And it turns out that the wallow tadpoles, the ones that came from wallows, metamorphosed faster in water that had, it was like wallow, wallow water. Okay. And the stream tadpoles metamorphosed faster in stream water. And so that suggests it's either something genetic or something environmental that, that changed the development of those tadpoles while they were in the egg, because she didn't catch them until they were act that actually hatched. That makes them um, more uh, develop faster in whatever habitat they were the edge related. That's yeah. a good question. Mm -hmm. They were the same species? Yep. Course wrong. Both course wrong. Yeah. So do they hide in there? Some of these wells would be dry for five, six, seven months. Yep. A rain four hours later, you have frogs. Yep. So, did they hibernate? No clue. Really? Yeah, they probably go somewhere and burrow down in the ground and just stay down there because once the coarse frogs stop breeding, you don't see them anymore until the next year. At least I hardly, I've never seen them. You know, they just vanish and they must go underground somewhere, but where they go, I don't know. I mean, I don't think they're burrowing under the wallows or they get squashed when the bison roll. <laughs> right? So, uh, you know, you, we don't know where they go. And I was out on a bird crew one day and saw one hopping across the prairie. It was a damp day. It had high humidity. But still, it was like, what the heck are you doing out here? <laughs> Little two-inch frog hopping across the prairie. So, so why any of the females would decide to go mate with a male in one of those wallows in the first place is beyond me. But they do. So I had a student who was going to look at them one year. And she went out. And it was really wet. There were there was water in every wall, everywhere. The frogs were everywhere. There were eggs everywhere. Um, it was great. And then we had two or three days of high, dry wind, and they were gone. So there went her research project, you know, just <laughs> dried up. Uh, so, so yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of interesting. And it may be, and we don't know this, but it's possible females can lay eggs in the stream and in one of these intermittent pools. And that way they've got their eggs in two baskets, right? One without predators and one, one with a little bit more stable environment. But we have no idea. We can't, we, we don't have radio tags small enough to track them. <laughs> Frogs that small yet, so. So yeah, it's, it's really cool. Um, the other really cool tree frog we have here is the cricket frog. Um, and there's two of them here. You may not see the one that looks like mud right off the bat, but it's in there. Uh, and apparently they can change color. I've never, I've never actually seen them change color. Most of the time they look like mud. But sometimes when the pond has a lot of vegetation out in the middle that's green, all the frogs will be green and they'll be sitting out on the vegetation instead of on the mud on the bank. But I was sitting out on the pond one day with a student. We were looking at, at cricket frogs or something. And a couple of the, the cricket frogs started doing this weird thing where they started kicking their legs out, right? And, and so it turns out they have a visual display along with their call. Um, and so we started looking at that 
And if you've ever gone to a pond where there's cricket frogs, there are thousands, there will be thousands of cricket frogs around. So there's seven in this picture. Right? And this is just like 15 centimeters here. So can anybody spot a frog? <laughs> you got one? Oh, yeah, I see one. Yeah, so, so there's actually seven. That's probably the one everybody saw. So there's seven of these guys just sitting there. And they'll just sit there. And, and if a bug happens to go by or, or a damsel fly flies over, they'll catch it and eat it, and then they'll go back to sitting until a chorus starts when they all start calling. And so here's a video. <laughs> yeah, we should have tested this too. So this is a video clip. Yep, there it goes. There's just no sound. So imagine a chorus of cricket frogs in the background. And all of the male frogs around the pond will start doing this. And then they'll hop around. Most of the time, there's only two of them circling around doing this. Um, but sometimes there's, there's also three or four or five that'll be hopping around doing this kind of display. And so, what the heck, right? <laughs> Is that a maiden display? <laughs> I think, well, I'll get to that in a minute. So, so these bouts will last for somewhere around three minutes usually. And then the chorus stops, everybody goes back to sitting again. Oops. Push the arrow in there. So these are the uh, the two frogs that were just in that display, or this yellow frog and blue frog. This is where they started. There's the edge of the pond, the water is there. This is a third frog who didn't join in. And I, at first I thought it was a female, but it was actually turned out to be a male. He just sat there and watched it. So these two hopped around, and then they ended up there. And they just went back to sitting. So who won? You know, one didn't get chased away. Who won? I, you can't. You can't tell. There's no way to tell who won the, the display, right? But they're obviously displaying. Um, so what's going on there is one of the things that that we're trying to figure out. And they'll use the right and left leg the same amount during a bout. So this is this is the average per minute of the times they use the right leg and the left leg. Um, so so they don't seem to favor a side. So there's some variation in that. This is left legs per minute and right legs per minute for individual frogs. And it's highly correlated, but sometimes you get one that maybe favors their left leg or something. Left leg, is that a word? Anyway, um, so, so that's highly correlated. And then this video, the females are out there, they're watching. And so this guy, he was calling a little bit. He, he hopped in from over here. There's a female right there. I know you can't see her, but she did it. He does these displays. And then he just kind of, you know, I'm like, oh, cool. He's going to go over to the female. She's going to be there. You know, something to happen. And he does this little display. And, you know, he turns away, does a couple more displays. And then he exits stage right. I'm like, <laughs> so I'm pretty sure this is only two instances like this that I've found where I've actually known that a male was displaying for me. So I'm pretty sure these displays are directed toward the females that are sitting around the pond out there. Um, but I haven't figured out a good way to measure that because how do you spot them, right? There could be females everywhere out there and you can't see them because unless they move because they're looking right? and the females mostly just sit. I sat and watched a female that I knew was a female for probably two hours one time and the only time she moved was to catch a bug, and then she just went back to sleep. So, not sure what's going on, but the, but it's a really cool display. And most of these kind of leg waving displays, visual displays that you see in frogs are in tropical frogs. This is the only one that gets up this far into the U.S. There's a couple of down in Florida, um, but this is the only one that anybody's described so far for farther north. Please go ahead and define Oh, amplexus. The Frogs are um, external egg layers and, and external breeders. Um, so when a female is ready to mate, a male will grab onto her and, and hang onto her back. Um, and then they both, she hops into the water with him and, and she'll lay her eggs and then he's in position to release sperm on, right on top of the eggs as the eggs are being released. 
So, so they have external fertilization, we call it. And all the frogs do that in toes. Um, so some of the ones in the tropics, males will hang on to the female because it's so rare that they run into a female, they'll hang on to the female for like a month and until she's ready to lay her eggs because if he lets go, he may not find one. And you know, during that time, he's not eating anything except unless he lands on her head where he can catch it, right? So, so yeah, it gets kind of kind of tough. Um, so another tree frog that is, is another one. I, I have like three favorite tree frogs. Um, this is this is actually two species of tree frogs: the copes and the gray tree frog, the eastern gray tree frog. Everybody calls them just gray tree frogs because you can't tell them apart. These these pictures are a cheat because both of them can be both of these colors, and they change colors when they're sitting on. Bark, they look like bark. When they're sitting on leaves, they look like leaves. And both species can do that. Um, the easiest way to tell them apart is supposedly the call, but their calls don't sound that different to me. Um, so anyway, the, uh, which one is it? I think versicol, I think we have chrysosceles and versicolor is farther to the east. So there's a, there's a little bit of a border in here um, and this one tends to be a little more to, toward the drier areas, and this one toward the drier area. but they do overlap, so it's really hard to tell them apart. Um, but they, they do change colors, and both can look like that. But the really interesting thing about them is not the fact that they can change colors. Well, one of the really interesting things about them, it, but they have different numbers of chromosomes. So every animal, or most animals, have two copies of each chromosome. Right, so humans, we're, we're call it diploid. Um, and you have one chromosome that came from your mother and one chromosome that came from your father. Chrysosceles is like that. They're diploid. Versicolor is tetraploid. They have four copies of each chromosome. Um, and how that happened? Probably some weird meiotic event at some point and they actually ended up still being viable uh, species. But that's, that's the real way you tell those apart, is to look at their chromosomes, which is not something you can generally do when you're out in the field and you got a frog. Another interesting thing about these frogs, so what happened to that person? <laughs> right? Yeah, so, so frogs can be poisonous. Right? What happened to that person? Not good. Right. So this is not the same thing, right? So so this is being poisoned. This is inven envenomated. <laughs> this is a venom. This is a poison. Right? So so it's two different things. So poisons are things that you have to eat in order to affect you. They are usually small molecules. The digestive tract, digestive system, none of the enzymes will break them down any further because they're small. They're already in their final form, right? So they just get absorbed right into your, your cells from your digestive system. Uh, a lot of poisons are plant-based. They're alkaloids. They come from plants originally. Venoms tend to be really large proteins that the animal makes itself. And so you could drink snake venom and it wouldn't hurt you because you have proteases that break down protein in your digestive system. So, and, and, and they're not going to get into your bloodstream until they've been broken down. So once they're in amino acid form, they've been broken down, they can't hurt you, right? So unless you've got a sore in your mouth or a uh, bleeding ulcer or something like that, it lets them get into your bloodstream. You can drink snake venom all day and do it too because you'll just digest the proteins. So for something to be a venom, it has to be injected. It gets, it's gotta get it into the bloodstream. Otherwise it just gets broken down. For something to be a poison, you eat it. So poisons probably evolved as an anti-predator device to keep from being eaten. And venoms evolved as a prey capture device to capture prey. And so animals that are poisonous, this is a poison dart frog not found in Kansas. I wish we had one here. Um, but these are really common in the tropics. 
They get their toxin from the bugs they eat, which probably get their toxins from the plants that the bugs eat, right? So it's an, it's an alcohol, it's plant, plant-based toxin. You can take these things into captivity and feed them something you know, other than their normal food, and they're not toxic. But there's some of the species that are so toxic, you can absorb it through your skin just by holding it. And they're the same size as our cricket frogs. Like there's a two inch frog that can kill you just because you hold it for a little while, right? And most of these animals have bright colors. They have uh, reds, yellows. They're, they're just, they're, they advertise, you know, like here I am, go ahead, try, you know? Um, or they have these really contrasty colors. It's, it's many mammals are not, not really good, don't have good color vision. They'll have contrasting colors. So like this would look like black and white, be very contrasty. Um, so that's a warning coloration. I'm, I'm confused. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, you say poisons have to be eaten. Right. You said you can die with this one good, this one through your skin. That well, yeah, that's true. But that they, they have to be absorbed. They can be absorbed pretty much anywhere. Um, but most of the time they're not in enough quantity to absorb through your skin. They got to absorb through the unprotected um, digestive tract cells. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, so yeah, they get poisons tend to get absorbed somewhere, right? They're not, but they're not injected physically into the bloodstream. And it turns out, so coming back to Kim, the gray tree frog got these bright yellow leg patches, and they are poisonous, which I didn't know until one of my dogs, I was moving a plant on my deck, a gray tree frog popped out of it, and one of my dogs grabbed it, immediately spit it out, started foaming in the mouth, just like he grabbed a toad. And the frog did this. This is, this is a typical toad display posture to say, leave me alone. They tuck their head down, they puff their body up, they look big. Um, and if you look carefully, you see this kind of thick fluid here um, on, on the back of his head. That's the toxin that it was secreted. And that's the only time I've ever had I've handled a bunch of these problems. I've never had one do that before, except that time that my dog grabbed me. Um, so if you do catch these, don't lick your fingers after you have them. Wash your hands before you leave. Um, though this toxin is probably not anywhere near close enough to kill you unless you ate several of those frogs. And also the, the toxins that these frogs have uh, and that toads have, they're called Toad toxin is called bufotoxin. I don't, I, I'm assuming that these frogs have a similar one. It's actually made by the frogs. It's one of the few poisons that is made by the animal that produces it instead of getting it from a bacteria or an insect or something like that. Okay, so we have five species of, of frogs that are mostly aquatic. So bullfrog, you're mostly probably familiar with. Um, the leopard frogs, so we have a couple different leopard frogs. We have plains and... Uh, the southern leopard frog, and I think the plains leopard frog is a little conzo down in the corner down there. Microhylic frogs are these little tiny flat frogs that actually live out in the open prairie under rocks. They're not around water most of the time. And don't be fooled by the names. They, they have the toad in their name, but they're actually frogs. Uh, and they mostly eat ants. So they're very ant predators. And this, this one is only now in that really wet Cherokee County. Okay. Um, and bistimid salamanders, these are the mole salamanders. They mostly live underground. And the only time anybody ever sees them is when they come up during breeding season, they walk to ponds and lay their eggs. And then they walk back and they go underground and you don't see them again for later. Um, this one is the only one that goes way out through the west. They're really cool salamanders. They're big. Um, that one tried to eat my finger one day because she thought it was a worm. We have one completely aquatic salamander, the mud puppy. Um, they live their entire life cycle in the water. And then we have one species of newt, which has the reverse life cycle. The, the larvae or the young is on land and the adult is in the water. So this is the adult. This is what we call the red eft. It lives on land. Um, and it's really brightly colored. So what do you think about it? 
poisonous. poisonous, right. And this is the one that has the, the bacteria that lives in its skin. Uh, that is, and, and when I was an undergrad taking a class in herpetology, my, my professor told me that one of the fraternities one time decided that instead of swallowing live goldfish, they would swallow live salamanders. And which one did they pick? This one. And they all ended up, in, a bunch of them ended up in the hospital. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> I don't think I want to say that. <laughs> so yeah, so don't eat, don't eat brightly colored animals. Um, we have three species of lungless salamanders, the plethodons, and those are the three species that are added to that and put in numbers down in here. Um, these tend to be forest salamanders from the east. And they're really small. They're, they're lungless because obviously they don't have lungs. They get all the air exchanged through their skin. So they have to keep their skin moist. And their skin is very important, which is true for all amphibians, really. They get a lot of air exchange and stuff through their skin. So their skins are, are very, very important for survival. This grotto salamander, we've only ever, ever found one adult in Kansas. So it's a really rare one. I think it lives in caves down there. Turtles. I'm going to go through the turtles fairly fast. I don't have good stories about turtles because I don't really know much about the turtles because I don't really, I don't, turtles seem kind of boring to me, but that's just me. Um, <laughs> so anyway, we have two snapping turtles, the regular snapping turtle, which is found here, and then the alligator snapping turtle. I do have one story of these. These things get enormous. I saw one one time that was at least this big. Huge, huge turtles. Those are all over the country. The snapping turtles, yeah. The yeah, the, the regular common one. We don't have the alligator snapping turtle on concept. They're somewhere because I'm sure I've seen last year. We'll talk. <laughs> I've got a picture of them. Of an alligator snapping turtle? Yeah. Oh, we'll have to look. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll look with these big bumpy. Yeah, we'll talk. <laughs> because if you've seen that on Kanza, that's a new species. It's a new species even for Riley County. Okay, uh, mud and musk turtles. I don't really know much about them, but they, except, you know, the mud and the musk. Um, so we have two species of that family. We have two species of soft shells, which don't have the hard protective shell. The shell is actually fairly flexible, leathery like. Um, so they tend mostly to be aquatic and, and they use their little nostrils as like a little small hole to stick about it with water to breathe. The ornate box turtle um, is probably the most common turtle in all of Kansas. And we have them all over the place here. They're out, they out wander around. They're not near water like many of the turtles are. Um, and then the painted turtle is also very common in Kansas, uh, except it tends to be a little more toward water, though you can find it about anywhere. And there are seven species of, of basking turtles. These are just the two most common. Are all of those turtles eating turtles? Eating turtles? Like you can turn them into turtle soup. I suppose you could. I've never eaten a turtle, so I don't know. <laughs> Are there particular species of turtle that people I, eat? I just I moved to from the Gulf Coast to Turtle Soup is a thing down there. Oh, they probably have bigger turtles down there. <laughs> you probably have to get a lot more turtles up here. Yeah. Um getting into the lizards, our biggest lizard in Kansas is the collared lizard. Um, they're also very sexually dimorphic, so the males look different than the females. This is a male. You've, you've if you've hiked Kanza, you've probably seen these sitting out on the on the rocks. Um, this is a female. They tend to be more cryptic colored and they don't sit up on the rocks very often where you can see them. Um, that one is a juvenile and, and he had that giant spider in his mouth when I caught him. So they, they're very predatory, very fast. Um, they're like little miniature raptors, dinosaur raptors. They get up on their hind leg and they run. And if you get close enough and you get a hold of them, they will bite you, and that hurts. <laughs> um, one of the things that, that we studied with these lizards 
is that they get trigger parasites. Most of the reptiles do. Um, they get triggers just the same as we do. And, and what bites you when you get triggers is the larva. It's not the adult trigger, it's the larva. Um, and they're naturally colored red. They don't actually drink blood. It doesn't make them red. They're just red in color. What they do is, is inject something that dissolves the cell uh, membrane, and then they slurp up cytoplasm of the cell. Right? So, so they don't, don't drink blood. Um, but you see these things on, on a lot of the reptiles, but they concentrate on collared lizards. Collared lizards seem to get more of these, and they usually get them behind in the armpits where the scales are thin, or around the eye or in the ear where, where the scales are not as thick. Um, and they make these bright red color patches. And this particular patch we, we did with that little camera that we were talking about. It's got a macro zoom lens on it. We were able to take pictures of them and then we can count them. So I had this poor undergraduate out. He was counting these chiggers. And he looked at chiggers on Kanza and out at Tuttle Creek Dam. Um, and this was in 2019 when there was a lot of water in the lake. And they actually sprayed all the vegetation on the face of the dam so they could watch for leaks because there was so much water in, in the lake. Um, and so there wasn't much vegetation out there. So he wanted to compare between here with the natural habitat and vegetation and out on, on the boat. And it turns out this is the average number of tiggers for males and females on Kanza and males and females out of the lake. And so less vegetation, fewer tiggers, which most of us probably already knew, right? Um, so, so that's kind of an, an interesting thing uh, with the lizards. And they don't seem to, it doesn't seem to bother them. I never see them scratching at them or anything, but they'll get little scabs. And they'll, when they shed their skin, they shed their chiggers off. With it so, but they all have them. Um, sand and spiny lizards, the phrynosoma lizards. We've got three species of those. Um, this is my favorite, the, the horned lizard, and it's, it's around here. We don't have the other two species here, at least not on Kanza, they're in Riley County. Um, and again, these are anteaters, okay? And then we have one species of the teabe lizards, which are the race runners. And this is the prairie race runner. We also have those here on Kanza. And these two lizards both like high temperatures. So in years when it's hot, these do well. Um, but this, they have different ways of getting away from predators. So what do you think the horn lizard that uses to avoid being eaten? Horn. Horns, yeah, but they're only about that big. <laughs> so the horns, yeah, that helps if once they've been grabbed. But camouflage. Camouflage, right. Have you, have you ever noticed one of these things when it's not moving? If any of you have ever seen them, they're really hard to spot if they're not actually moving. Um, these guys, on the other hand, they, the males at least have some bright colors in them, but they're wicked fast. And they avoid being eaten because they're, they're, they run away really fast. What's their habitat? Um, here, I mostly see them over around the Hokanson homestead. So they, they tend to like some wooded, wooded kind of areas, the race runners. These guys are out in the open. They like rocks. Yeah, they'll they'll both be around in the rocks. Yeah. You'll see that lizard down towards the spring house and they'll find the front open so sometimes. Yeah. Oh, I've got a bunch of them. I just want them to build something. Oh, yeah, they like rocks. Oh, any of the lizards like rocks. <laughs> I have these at my house. They they drive my dog crazy because when I'll be out sunning on the in the leaves of the flower bed will come out the front and it'll darken the hole and he's like ah, too late. Um, so skinks, skinks are kind of long, elongated lizards with real short legs. They they mostly burrow. This is the largest species that we have in Kansas, uh, the Great Plains skink. And you see them around campus a lot too. I rescued one of the babies out of the swimming pool one time. I got one so big and fat that he just lays hard to touch the ground and it's a day. <laughs> and then the ground skink. Um, so these are the size differences. We've got six species of these things. The biggest is the Great Plains skink and the broadhead, which is farther to the east. They get up to nine inches long. Um, the ground skink is really small. They're only three or four inches long. 
And they have pretty much all of them when they're juveniles, they have these bright blue shells, uh, which they use to, to attract predators. And originally, when they first came through and, and uh, were identifying species here, they thought these were two different species, but they're actually the same. Glass lizards. So this Sorry, is. Can I ask you a question? They they use the blue tail to attract predators. Yeah, to the tail. Okay, I got. It. And then they break it up. I got. It. Which we'll talk more about here in just a minute. Yeah. Got yeah. Sorry. <laughs> um. Glass lizards. So this is a lizard, but it has no legs. It is a legless lizard. And some of the features you can use to tell that it is a lizard and not a snake is that they have eyelids. Snakes don't have eyelids. They have a clear scale that covers the eye that protects it. So they, they, they don't blink or anything like that. So, so in Harry Potter, when the snake winks at him, that's a lie. They can't wink. They don't have eyelids. I had a friend once who told me that was the only problem you had with Harry Potter. <laughs> um, they also have, lizards have external ear openings. You can see right here on this one. Um, snakes don't have external ear openings either. Uh, snakes actually pick up sound vibrations through their lower jaw, which is connected into the inner ear. So that's what, how they, they get sound. They don't have the external ear openings. What was the ear opening? Right here. If you ever catch one, you can see it. Though if you catch a glass lizard, be sure you grab it up in the front one third of the body. Otherwise, it'll be gone. Because these animals do something called tail autonomy. So a lot of the lizards can do this. The skinks do it all the time. Uh, glass lizards do it all the time. It's how they got their name, being glass lizards. So this little video, if I can get it to play. Why is it not playing, Jill? Okay. Try return. Nope. <laughs> oh well. Well, it was a a, a um, video of a gecko tail that had been autonomized that was jumping up and down this way, and 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 it was a video from above too, so you could see it going up and down, and you could see it going back and forth. And they have this thing called a central pattern generator in their tail. It's a group of nerves that cause rhythmic motion. So we have them too. It's how we can walk without thinking about it. So once you get started walking, you're the central pattern generator in your head makes over in charge of your brain. You just do this kind of, or your legs, and you just do this rhythmic walking thing, right? You don't have to think about, I'm gonna move this foot, I'm gonna move this foot. Um, so these are things that can be anywhere in the body and these lizards have them in the tail and they cause the muscles to contract until they start, the cells start running out of oxygen and then they start dying. Right? And when, when animal, these lizards autonomize their tails, they do it voluntarily and they break the tail at a fracture plane of the vertebrae. So they break individual vertebra in half. They don't break the tail between vertebrae, right? They break the vertebra itself. And if you cut their tail off between vertebrae, they can't grow it back. But because they break it themselves at that fracture plane, there's um, cellular structures at the fracture plane that allow them to regenerate the cell. Right? So they have to do it voluntarily in order to be able to grow it back. How quickly will they regenerate? It depends probably on how much they eat, and it depends on the species. Um, skinks, like this one, you can see where it broke its tail off. You can usually tell if they've broken their tail <laughs> uh, because it'll be a different color. And the scales sometimes will be a little bit different. Um, and another thing about them is that they can't regrow bone. So the tail that grow, grows back has no vertebrae. In it. it has just a cartilaginous rod that runs down the length of it that's flexible. So they don't have as much movement in that regrown tail as they do in the original tail, right? Because they don't have the vertebrae with the muscle attachments to the vertebrae. So skinks, when they break their tails off, they regrow pretty much the entire leaf. And as I said, it depends on how much they eat um, and how warm they are and things like that as to how fast they grow back. Um, and I've never actually, I should look at the literature. So break it off again, they'll come back again? As long as they've got vertebrae. So that's one of the problems. If they get up and they break that last vertebrae, they can't do it again. 
Right, so so they've got to break it far enough, far enough down that they've got some vertebrae left if they ever want to use that as an anti predator monster. But that thrashing tail attracts the predator because the predators are all about movement, and then the lizard can escape. Glass lizards do this too. And so here are two lizards that are the same body length. So nose to cloaca is about there. So they got about the same body length. But this one is intact. And that one has broken its tail off, possibly multiple times. So this is another way you can tell a snake from a lizard. This um, the body is pretty much one third of the total length, always. It's a very consistent ratio. In a snake, you'd only have about the last two inches of this animal being body if this were a snake, or the be tail if this were a snake. They, their bodies are much, much longer than lizard bodies. How do you tell body from snake from tail? You have to turn them over and look for the cloaca. That's the end of the body, is, is where the cloaca is. Yeah, Ken's not going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> well, if, if you grab a glass lizard, the front third of it is the body. I love glass lizards. <laughs> Snakes, everything but the last couple of inches is body. So, this is that, that ratio. Um, here's the proportion of tail length to tunnel length. Um, and this was animals that we went down to the KU Natural History Museum and we measured body length versus tail length and a whole bunch of these animals. And these are the ones with impact tail. This is snout vent length is, is the body length um, and then the ratio of the tail. And so with intact tails, they're you know right around that one third mark. Um, and it doesn't change over size, the body, the body size. If you look at the ones with broken tails, The tail gets shorter, the bigger the body is. And reptiles grow their whole life. So the bigger they are, presumably the older they are. That's a little, little iffy because it also depends on how much they eat. Um, but it looks like these guys are breaking off, you know, small pieces of their tail as they go along. And some of them are more likely to break their tail off than others. I've handled some that I, I don't know, you know, I've handled multiple times in many different ways that I've had activity and they've never broken their tail off. And others, you barely look at them and they'll break their tails off. So, so there seems to be, I don't know if it's personalities or, or what, but um, you get some that are get real jittery and they'll break their tail off right away and some that. There's also some differences in regeneration. And with the glass lizards, we never found any of the glass lizards grow more, back more than about um, an inch of tail. So they don't grow back the entire length, probably because since they don't have legs, a cartilage, you know, something that they can't move is not going to be very helpful to be dragging along this piece of tail that only has cartilage in it that they're not able to move. Um, so they only grow back a little bit. And then they'll, they'll do this, the shorter they are, they do this kind of lunging um, motion instead of trying to crawl. So it's, it's interesting. They're just as fast, but they have a different way of moving when the tail is short. And the males tend to grow back more than the females do, um, probably because females are putting some of their energy into eggs and less into growing back tails. Oh, and, and the only things that can grow back bone are amphibians. So amphibians like salamanders, frogs, they can grow back an entire leg, bones and all. But reptiles can't do that. And here's the reason we don't know more about glass lizards than we do. There's a glass lizard in there. They don't get into our traps. They don't get under cover boards. They're not under rocks. But there's a bunch of them out there. We just can't find them. So there he is. If you didn't see. Well, how do you find them? Usually just because you're walking along and you see them. See them both. Yeah. He's, well, sometimes if they're crossing the road or something like that, they'll see them. sometimes they'll be out basking on the trail on the rock. There's quite a few on the second part of the trail. 
So getting into snake, anybody know what that is? I got a vote for a king snake. <laughs> got a rat snake. Rattlesnake. See, that's that's the, what I figured everybody would say. It was a rattlesnake. Because this is the typical posture you see in a rattlesnake. And if I could play the sound, it would sound like a rattlesnake. But this is actually a rattlesnake mimic. It's a bull snake, right? So it's the, the longest snake in Kansas. They get up to seven feet long, um, fairly thick body. They're around farms a lot because they eat rodents that are attracted to farms. This picture is not in your, in your notes because I didn't want to give it away. <laughs> um, so these things, I had one of these things one time that was seven feet long and he would eat a dozen mice at a feet. So, so they're good things to have around, but because they mimic rattlesnakes, they get killed a lot. So these are in the family Colubridae, which most of our snakes in Kansas are. Uh, we have 14 species of them. And these are snakes, they're called harmless egg-laying snakes. They, they actually lay eggs that then hatch. Um, and they're not venomous. So when you look at the teeth of these snakes, all of their teeth are the same size all over their, their whole skull. Um, and they have jaws that are not, are, are totally unarticulated. So it doesn't look like in this image, but, but these upper jaw is not fused into part of the, to the skull. They can actually move their upper jaw. And both jaws have hinges in the front. So they move all four parts of the jaw in the pinna. That lets them open their mouths up really wide and swallow really big prey or prey that are bigger than their heads. They also have special adaptations to their trachea that their trachea doesn't get collapsed while they're swallowing something huge. So we have a number of these um, in Kansas. The, one of the most common is the racer. You've probably all seen those around. Um, they're a decent sized snake. Uh, they have a yellow belly here. At east, they're black with a white belly, so they're harder to tell from the grass. We also have three king snake species, including the milk snake. Um, anybody know what that's mimicking? Normal snake. Right. So can you tell, do you know how to tell the difference? Red on yellow, yellow belly, red on black, yellow Right. Right. So so. It, they have yellow stripes and it touches the red, then it's coral snake. If they have yellow stripes and it touches the black, then it's king snake. Because there's several king snakes that have yellow instead of a white. Okay. But we don't have coral as well, no. No, there are no coral snakes here. Um, they're in Florida, southern Georgia. How are we doing on time, Jill? Am I like way over? <laughs> oh, okay. Um, yeah, so. These guys, this only works in North America. Don't go to Central or South America and think that red on yellow will save you because it won't. <laughs> the mimics in Central and South America look a lot more like they, there's no easy way to tell them apart. So, so anything with bright colors in the tropics, don't touch it. Um, we have a couple of rat snakes, the Great Plains rat snake. Tends to be out more in the open areas. Uh, the western or black rat snake tends to be more in the woods. And these guys are excellent climbers. This one's going straight up the tree trunk. Um, they go for birds. Um, and one of my favorite black rat snake stories, aside from face fiber, which is one I had for a while, um, was when I was giving a talk here in the barn when it was still a barn and we had barn swallows flying around in the barn. And, and I was doing a talk like this. and. I, I was looking at my slides. I hear screams. I turn around. Everybody's plastered against the wall. I'm like, what the heck? And this rat snake had fallen out of the rafters where it was apparently hunting, hunting barn swallow eggs into the middle of the audience. Good timing. <laughs> yeah, it was great. And so, so I went, oh, it's a black snake. And caught it. And I told them all about the black snake. And then I took it outside and turned it loose. But I never got their attention back. So the whole rest of the talk, they were staring at the rafters. <laughs> So if you ever want to lose, completely lose the attention of your audience, not have to pay any attention to them, just drop the snake in the door. Do you also find the great plains rat snakes on the prairie looking for prairie birds, yes. upland birds, rather than, because I found one up by, uh, near, near the, not the scenic overlook, but behind the 
Yes, they will. And racers will too. Um, racers are big predators of birds, um, some of the king snakes. And, and there's a king snake that looks almost exactly like the great plains rice. Uh, they're, they're very similar in color pattern. Uh, the best way to tell the rat snakes apart, they've got a bit of a flare on their head right behind them. Uh, at the back of the head. It's not as much as you see on a, on a venomous snake, but a king snake is just straight from neck to head, and the rat snakes flare out. This is also something they used to make flight suits for pilots back in the day because these guys can climb straight up a tree without losing blood pressure in their head and passing out. And they've got muscle, special muscle contractions that put pressure on the back of the body blood going up to the head. So they use that to, to create pressurized flight suits. Uh-oh. Am I not going forward? There. So then the another family, the harmless live bearing snakes. So these are animals that have eggs, but they keep them inside the body. The eggs hatch inside the body. Uh, and then the, the mother gives live birth. So the most common of these garter snakes you see all over the place. Brown snakes are really common, but they tend to burrow. Um, a lot of people dig them up in their gardens. They send me pictures of them. What do they send? Do my garden? Um, yeah, they only get about this big to eat earthworms. They're not, not pretty good. Um, so those are fairly common. Rear fang snake. So probably most of you at some point have picked up a ring neck. You were handling a venomous snake. But they're part of this group called the rear fang. They're, they have specialized and large teeth at the back of the mouth that point backwards so that when they're swallowing something, they're injecting venom in it as they move their jaws along and bite it. Um, and for ringnecks, it's mostly earthworms and grubs and insects and things like that. Um, so there's seven species of these in so Kansas. You those, yeah. You no. Which won't fit because they're really small. <laughs> and most of the weird. <laughs> I've actually never had one try, one of these try to bite me. They are not nicer person than mine. And they actually do this display to warn people, warn predators off. They they flip over and they curl their tail up and they've got those bright colors on their belly. Mm -hmm. to try to predator to um but they can't do much damage, even if they could bite. And, and whatever it is, it's got to get all the way back to the back fangs in order for it to work. There are some rear fang snakes that are highly venomous, but they're in the tropics. Like I say, tropics. Don't touch them. <laughs> um, the boom slang, if anybody's ever heard of the boom slang, that's, that's one of these guys. And, and they're deadly. You know. I think it's just my boy, but anyway. Um, so we have seven species of these, uh, like the ring neck, uh, the worm snake, which looks a lot like a worm. Both of these are burrowing. They hunt worms. Uh, worm snakes are a, a lot less common. And one of the really interesting things we found when we were doing our study of burn frequencies with reptiles is that these guys, these are one of the species that prefer in unburned areas. And in the unburned area, they're bigger, both in length and in weight. Than they are in the more frequently burned areas. So the red boxes on here are body length, and the blue boxes are mass. And these numbers are, or these letters are whether it's significant or not. So this is significantly different than this, and then that one's in between. Um, and we've got no idea why they're different in size. Oh, and the box is actually standard error. So we've got mean here, standard error. This is the minimum and the maximum. Um, we don't know why they're bigger there. There's a couple of different hypotheses. My one of the one that I'm interested in that I've never gotten around to testing is that we get the big invasive earthworms in the unburned areas, and the more native smaller earthworms in the burned areas. And so that since that's their main food source, I suspect they're getting more food for prey on the big. Thing. Unburned areas, but I've never been able to test that. The 
Okay. Yes, but it's you can't just use size as an age because it depends on how much you eat. We don't have a way to age snakes. Yeah. Uh, ring necks. Sorry, these were ring necks. Um, and yeah, yeah, you can't age snakes because because they have that indeterminate growth. They grow all the time through their whole life. They do get bigger as they get older, but it depends a lot on what they eat. So they could go for months between eating in a year, and they won't grow very much that year. Um, but if they eat a lot, then they may shed five or six times during the year and, and grow quite a bit. So, um, two of the other species that we have in Kansas that are rear fang are the hognose snakes. And hognose snakes have these really interesting uh, anti predator things to like they can flatten out the ribs like cobras do, make themselves look bigger, and they can also play dead. So most predators cue on movement. And so if you if something's after you and you pretend to be dead, then it might lose interest in you, right? Um, and I had a friend who was trying to photograph one of these one time and it started playing dead. And he's like, ah. Oh. So he flipped it back over and it immediately rolled back over and played dead again. Which doesn't seem very helpful, but that's how it's playing dead right Yep, yep. They they open their mouths and let their tongues hang out and everything. I've seen that in the middle of a residential spree. Yeah, playing dead in the middle the best, of the road. Yeah, that's probably not the best place. The best place to do that. So she yeah. would have been playing if I was trying. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I need to get out All right, you're not allowed around any of my animals. Okay, last couple of snakes, um, and the and the types of teeth they can have. So crotalidae, these are the venomous snakes that we have in Kansas. We have six species. Um, and Crotalidae, the family Crotalidae, they have those movable front enlarged teeth, right? So they're they're like hypodermic needles. They're hollow, and they're they're really long compared to the to the size of the snake. And they they have to fold backward for the snake to be able to close its mouth, right? So um, these snakes tend to inject mostly digestive enzymes when they bite. And then the animals that we don't find in Kansas, but this is the other type, the last type of skull that you see in snake. Um, these are the elapids. These are the snakes that are cobras, crates, sea snakes, um, black mambas, like this one. Um, these have little short fangs. They have enlarged teeth, but they're short compared to their body length. And they have a little groove. They're not hypodermic needles. They, they just have a little groove in the side of the fang that lets that the venom drips down. They also tend to inject more neurotoxins than digestive enzymes. So they don't have to get as deep in the body. Um, it's thought that these big hypodermic fangs evolved in species that were in more northern areas that were eating larger prey. And because they were colder, they wouldn't digest them as fast. And if you eat something, and if a reptile or a snake eats something and it doesn't stay warm enough to digest it fast enough, it, the prey item can actually rot in their stomach and end up making them sick and killing them. So they have to be warm to digest, or they have to do something to speed up that digestion. And so it's thought that that injecting the digestive enzymes deeper into the body of the prey starts the digestion from the inside as well as from the outside. Um, so if if you read about treatments for snake bites, is, has anybody ever seen where you, you can wrap it in an ace bandage? Nobody's seen that. Nobody looks at snake bite stuff. <laughs> That's something you don't want to do with one of our snakes. That's an Australian thing where they have all of these elapids that are uh, neurotoxins. So if you get bitten with something that has a neurotoxin, you don't want that neurotoxin to spread to, to the nerves in your heart and your brain, right? Uh, because that, that is really bad. So you can slow that down by putting a pressure pressure bandage on, um, and they do that instead of tourniquets because people, when they put tourniquets on, they sometimes make them too tight and you end up losing the whole limb because you cut off all the circulation. You don't want to do that either. Um, but you put one of those pressure bandage on there, and it works for that. If you do that with with a snake like ours, the crotalus, then you're trapping those digestive enzymes at the wound site, and you'll get a lot more damage to that particular site. Whereas if you let it circulate through the bloodstream, your immune system will actually attack, attack those proteins 
and, and break them down. So, so actually it can be helpful if you let it circulate. As long as you just stay calm and don't let it circulate too much. <laughs> okay. um, so, so if you're ever bitten by one of these guys, you want to stay calm, don't do anything to it, the wound, and go to a hospital as fast as you can. That's a contradiction term because you were natural in your heart was going to go up because you don't do anything. Yeah, I know, but I but you need to you need to stay as calm as possible. One of these. It's apparently very painful because I have a dog that was bitten twice. You can taste it. And and it's the only thing I've ever seen him show pain to. You can taste it in your mouth immediately. Really? <laughs> anyway. <laughs> so of our been mistakes, we have copperheads. Um, this is the only one that's found on Kanza so far. Um, there's there's actually two species of copperhead now, and the one we have here is contortus. Um, venoms and, and poisons, too, are also being looked at for drug uh, use because they do all kinds of things like prevent blood from clotting or cause blood to clot or all kinds of stuff like that. And, and they've actually found in copperheads um, a substance that prevents metastasis in cancer. So they're working on a cancer drug from this particular species. So healing venomous snakes is bad. It's bad. So Yvonne on the, the Zoom uh -huh. says or asks, is head shape always an indicator of a snake that is venomous? Only in Crotalis. It doesn't work in Alacus. The Alacus look just like any other smooth snake. And it's not as obvious in some of, of the pit vipers either. I'll show you one in a little bit that looks a lot like a, a rat snake in terms of head shape. But it is a rattlesnake. It has a rattle, so it's not that other. Copperheads, the easiest way to tell copperheads is that they've got this very distinctive pattern. I don't think there's anything else in Kansas that has a pattern like this. It goes from belly on one side across the top to the belly on the other side. Milk snake does that too, but it's red, black, and white. So it's really not, you can tell it's not a copperhead, right? Um, but you can see it goes all the way down to the belly and then across, and it's narrower in the back. Most of the other snakes have patterns that are blotches stuck in the middle of the back on this pattern. And they don't go all the way down. But they also have that broader head. And the juveniles have a little yellow tail that they wiggle around to attract things that get to eat. Oh, parthenogenesis. Do we have time to do parthenogenesis or should I just skip ahead? What time is it? It is 10.39. You might want to skip ahead. Yeah, let's skip ahead. This takes a while to explain. Okay. There's a bunch of snakes and lizards that can do parthenogenesis, in which you have a female that doesn't need a male in order to make babies. And if you're interested in that, ask me about it later. Okay, cottonmouth is um, in the same genus as the copper head. And as we said a little while ago, they're only found in Cherokee. So things that you see around here that people are always saying, ah, it's a cotton mouth, it's probably a water snake, which look kind of similar to other people. Timber rattler is the biggest one here. They're, they're restricted to wooded areas, uh, partially forested hillsides, and they're pretty easy to tell. They've got that red stripe that comes down the middle of their back, and they have really broad heads. The most common rattle, uh, venomous snake in Kansas is the uh, fairy rattlesnake. They're in the western two thirds of the state. Um, the rest of them are in the east. And these get pretty big, um, but they're mostly out in the dry areas. And I've, I've talked to people who are out, go out in western Kansas, and they're, they're really common out there. And then this is the one that's a little harder to tell from a regular snake. Um, they got a color pattern fairly similar to a rat snake. Um, their head doesn't flare out as much and they're smaller. They're they're in the group called pygmy rattlesnakes. So they don't get very big. But they do have a rattle. And another distinguishing characteristic of, of these snakes is that they're fat. They have a plump body. These don't have as plump a body as, as some of the others, but but they're wider. They're not 
one size the entire length with a tapering tail. They're just big, fat, chunky snakes. And if they've got a rattle on the end, they've got a shorter tail. How do you pronounce that? Sisturus? No. Or the, the Masasaga? Masasaga, yeah. And these could potentially be on, on Kanza. They, they like open prairies. But in Kansas, they seem to concentrate more around wetland areas. So you find them a lot around China bottoms. We have them Yeah. And that's it. Thank you, Eva. You're welcome. <laughs>